My name's Steve Robinson, I'm Minister here at Gorse Hill and it's great to welcome you whether you're joining us here in the building or whether you're joining us online via Facebook. And notices for the forthcoming week are on the website, so please uh, pick that up if you're able. If you're not receiving the email with the notices, let us know and we can arrange for you to receive an update of all that goes on here at Gorse Hill. After the service, coffee is available in the hall, so please join us there. We do encourage you to continue wearing your mask as you move around and as you stand to sing, but if you are seated and want to remove it, you're welcome to do so. We will update you as COVID restrictions and advice changes, as we understand that it's doing over the course of the next couple of weeks, but we will keep you updated and let, and let you know. I'm going to introduce the worship group who are going to lead us in the first couple uh, of songs this morning. So please stand, celebrate, share God's love. But I'm going to open with a word of prayer. Thank you, Father God, for this new day. Thank you for bringing us here together. Thank you that you are ever-present, that you are an ever-present help in times of trouble and ever-present support in places of joy. Lord, be with us. Be ever present with us this morning. In Jesus' name, we pray. Amen. Over to you, Matt. Be very able to invite you to stand. Praise the Oh, mm -hmm. 
Happy day, you washed my sins away. What a wonderful song that is that reminds us of what God has done in all of our lives if we truly, if we receive Jesus as our Saviour and Lord. 
Our sins are washed, life is changed, the future's assured. Now, I want to ask you a couple of questions this morning. We've been thinking about what it means to be part of a church. Um, so, I've got a sort of illustration this morning, and I want you to help me, if you can, to, to tell me what these two tins are about. Well, the labels aren't on the tins, so it's kind of a bit of guesswork as to what's inside. However, that's a round tin with a pull top. It could be anything. It could be dog food. It could be cat food. It could be something really edible, couldn't it? But probably you might guess something about what's in this tin because of its shape. Spam. Corned beef. You reckon it's got to be corned beef or spam? Well, it's a bit of a giveaway because you can look at this tin and see it's a certain shape. And probably if you've eaten or seen one of these tins before, you know it's a certain shape and what it's got inside, don't you? Well, the giveaway is the side that I didn't show is that little key that's on the side. And doesn't it make you wonder that after all these years, they haven't invented a better way of getting into it? The key breaks, the metal doesn't work, and you end up using a tin opener anyway. Well, at least I do. So some things you look at and you see and you know kind of what it is, even if it doesn't advertise itself. But the issue is sometimes you look at something and you see it and you think, well, what on earth is inside it? What on earth can it be? Who wants to take the risk of opening it? Oh, no. Oh, no. Cat food. Come on, Steve, come and help me. You're close by. Now, Steve, you know, there's a few questions here, a few guesses. Come on. Yeah. <laughs> it's all right, don't worry. I don't think it's going to blow up. Right. So if, if I sort of shake it, yeah. can, can you hear what's inside it? Have a shake and have a listen. What do you think is inside it? What's it? What sound is it making? Have a listen. Can of beans. Can of beans. Okay. Okay, Steve. Right. Okay. Now. So far, so good. So far, so good. It's not beans. Have a tip. Oh, it's um, chickpeas. Oh, safe. Thank you very much, Steve. Thank you very much for your help. You see, some things you can look at and you don't know what it is until you open it. And, of course, it's perfectly edible, so you were right to trust me. Well done. And it wasn't going to blow up either. And, and kind of when we're thinking of God's church, some things you can see about God's church, like a building, some things you can see like symbols and our banners all around and you know we've got a lovely new banner at the back and a lovely new one at the front one at the back is about our pastoral care the one at the front is, is about our our uh, special verse for 2022 our, our motto text so some things about church you can see some things about church that you can't and the things you can't see is what's in a person's heart well at least you don't see them initially what you do see is when someone opens the can, as it were, when you encounter someone, when you meet someone, when you talk to someone, and then the true nature of the church comes out. So the church is visible. It's a building, it makes a statement here in Gorse Hill. People often see it and walk past and say how lovely the building looks. But actually, perhaps what they don't see is the impact that your life and mine can make on them as well. So sometimes we have to open the tin up, as it were, to actually expose or reveal our life to everybody else so they can understand it. You know, most people wouldn't understand what a church looks like because there's a cross on the outside. Most of us understood what this was, if we're of a certain age or above. It's, it's a tin of corned beef, actually. I took the label off this morning, so I will have to eat it now so I don't forget what it is. But, you know, when we think about the church, let's think of what people see but also what we can show them, what we can demonstrate, what we can be to the people around us, what we can share together. Now, we don't take up an offering in church, but we want to pray and give thanks for what's been given so far. We're thankful that we met the target of, 
of their Christmas appeal. So thank you very much. That's great. We heard a bit about that last week. So just a couple of things to draw your attention to. Tonight, we've got a prayer meeting in, in the hall at 6.30. That's a time when we're listening to God, waiting on God. We're going to hear a bit of report back from Charles Stone, who does some of their cat work for us. So there's a particular reference to pray for people uh, with financial needs in the community. So we'll hear a specific thing then, but there is a general opportunity for us to read the scriptures and to pray together. So we're not singing. You won't hear a sermon, but we'll hear God's word uh, as we share together. There will be coffee after the service, so please join us there. Uh, if you'd like some mission materials about the mission agencies that we support, there's some there at the back. And just to let you know, in two weeks' time, uh, three weeks' time, on the 13th of February, we've got the Leprosy Mission who are coming to, to, to take the service for us on the Sunday morning. Next Sunday, Colin is speaking and leading the service, so please come and join us as we continue to think about what it means to be a church, that is, God's people here in Gorse Hill. It's particularly important as we face a time of change, both within the fellowship and how we respond to changes in the world around us. So that's very important to, to think about as, as we share in prayer together. Let's take a moment to pray. Our young friends are leaving us for their own time and they'll rejoin us at the end of the service. So let's now pray. Thank you, God, for all the good things that you give to us. Thank you, God, that we can see you at work, that, that we know what it is that you are doing to us and for us. We pray, God, that we would give thanks each day for the good things that you give, thanking you for one another, for this fellowship, and for all that we share together. We pray especially now for our younger friends. Bless them, we pray, in their work and in their life and in their studying. We pray for your blessing upon those who lead them and who care for them today. We also thank you, Lord, for the good things that you've given and of the things that we give back through our offering, through our support, through our time, through our money. We pray that you would bless all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. The younger ones are leaving us now for their own time. We'll rejoin one another later. We're going to, to pray in just a few moments. And as we pray, there's a video clip which comes from Tear Fund, which tells us something about God's work across the world. I want our prayers to really be focused in two particular areas, and I'll be leading us in that. We want to pray for, for God's work across the world as people grapple with climate change. We want to pray for the week of Christian unity as we remember God's witness through all the churches both of this town and across our nation. Remember, too, that this is Leprosy Week. We'll hear a lot more about the support for people suffering from leprosy in a couple of weeks' time. But we remember those suffering from this disease, which is one of those diseases which marginalises people in so many countries across the world. People are rejected, they're isolated, they're, they're taken away from their families, and it is truly a disease that, that breaks people's spirit as well as breaks their bodies. But it is easy, it is easy to cure. So let's just read from the scriptures first. And I've taken some verses from Psalm 31. It speaks of our trusting in God, of being ready to put ourselves and our times and who we are into God's hands. I'm reading from verses 1 to 5 and verse 15 to 16 of Psalm 31. As I read this through, look at the words refuge, rock, fortress. So hear God's word. In you, Lord, I have taken refuge. Let me never be put to shame. Deliver me in your righteousness. Turn your ear to me. Come quickly to my rescue. Be my rock of refuge a strong fortress to save me. Since you are my rock and my fortress, for the sake of your name, lead and guide me. Keep me free from the trap that is set for me. For you are my refuge. 
Into your hands I commit my spirit. Deliver me, Lord, my faithful God. My times are in your hands. Deliver me from the hands of my enemies, from those who pursue me. Let your face shine on your servant. Save me in your unfailing love. Verse 5 struck me particularly reading, rereading this this morning. They're words that Jesus quoted on the cross. Into your hands I commit my spirit. Perhaps that should be a daily prayer for all of us to commit ourselves, our lives, our times, our opportunities, our dreams, our fears, our problems, all into God's hands. Because in God we have our refuge, we have our strength, we have our rock, our fortress. And verse 15, my times are in your hands. We come to pray, to share the needs of our hearts and our lives to a God who is sovereign, Lord of all. My times, myself, all that I am, are in your hands. We're going to see a video clip now, which is produced by Tear Fund, which shows the effects of climate change and also the response of churches in Bangladesh. It, it's a challenging video because we talk much about climate change here, and yet somehow when you see this video, you see people living right on the edge of this very climate change and how it affects them. So thank you, we'll see that video and then we'll pray. I'm a name Martin Chandra Boyragi. I'm a Shadurpur Christian Polite Baptist Mandolin. The Mohona Shoja Shojai Amar Abostan. A Yobostan er Karone. Chor Jokoniashe by a Gurnijor Jokoniashe. প্রথমত আঘাতানে আমাকে বা আমার এই কমিউনিটিকে তারপরে অন্যত্র চাই কিন্তু সে এই 2007 পরবর্তী সময় একটি বছর পাওয়া যায়নি যে বছরে অন্তত 5 থেকে 10টি ঘূর্ণিঝড় আসেনি ঝড় ঝঞ্জা হওয়া মানে এই ঘূর্ণিঝড় আসা মানে আমাদের ফসল নষ্ট হয়ে যাবে ফসল নষ্ট হয়ে যাওয়া মানে আমাদের খাদ্যের সংকট সংকট দেখা দেবে শুধুমাত্র যে আমাদের কি বলবো বাসস্থানের সংকট ঘটায় তা নয় একবারে সবকিছু তসনস করে চলে যায় দুর্যোগ প্রত্যেকই কষ্ট দেয় না দেখলে যেটি বিশ্বাস করা যাবে না এখানে বাসতে হলে প্রতিনিয়ত যুদ্ধ করে বাসতে হবে এরকম যেমনটি আমি আরেকটি বিষয়ের কথা বলতে পারি একটি বট গাছে 250 জনের মানুষ মত মানুষ চড়েছিল কারণ তারা সাইক্লোন শেল্টারে যাবার কোনো সুযোগ পায়নি মুহূর্তের মধ্যে চারিদিক থেকে জল চলে আসছে তারা নামলে পড়ে মারা পড়বে স্রোতে ভাসিয়ে নিয়ে যাবে তো এই অভিজ্ঞতা আমি সহ আমার এলাকার মানুষের আমি মনে করি চার্জ শুধু গির্জার জায়গা নয় প্রভুকে ডাকার জায়গা নয় মানুষকে সেই সমস্যা যখন আসে হতে পারে তার রোগের সমস্যা হতে পারে তার পরিবারে দন্দের সমস্যা হতে পারে প্রাকৃতিক সমস্যা এই সব সমস্যা থেকে যেন ওভারকাম করতে পারে সেই ক্ষেত্রে সহায়তা চার্জ দিয়ে থাকি আমি রিলিফে বিশ্বাসী নই কিন্তু ওই মানুষটিকে যদি জমি থাকলে সেই জমিতে কিভাবে কাজ করবে তাকে বীজ দেওয়া যেতে পারে তার যদি রাস্তায় গাড়ি চালাবার অ্যাবিলিটি থাকে একটি গাড়ির ব্যবস্থা করা যেতে পারে হতে পারে যে আমাদের মাছ ধরার ব্যবস্থা থাকলে মাছ ধরার সেই সরঞ্জাম দেওয়া যেতে পারে সুতরাং খালি পেটে যেমন একজন অসুস্থ ব্যক্তিকে যদি আমরা বলি শুধু তুমি প্রভুকে ডাকো এটি যেমন উপযুক্ত নয় তার খাদ্য এবং চিকিৎসার ব্যবস্থা করতে হয় সেই ভ্রাতা ভগ্নীকে খ্রিস্টে আশ্রিত ভ্রাতা ভগ্নীর কাছে আমার বিশেষ বিনতি রয়েছে তারা যেন আমাদের জন্য মহান প্রভুর কাছে খ্রিস্টের কাছে প্রার্থনা করে যেন আমাদের যে সমস্যা বলি একটু আগেই আমি অনেক সমস্যার কথা তুলে ধরেছি
opportunities to pray, to remember those brothers and sisters in Christ, not only persecuted because of their faith, and to be a Christian in that part of the world is indeed to be very marginalised, it's to be very uh, part of a very small group in a, in, a, in a challenging world, but also facing physical issues. And Pastor Martin asked us to pray for him and his response to those needs. We'll also pray for our own response to the need to work together as churches in our nation and beyond. But also pray for those who are affected by leprosy, for those for whom Christ went to the cross for, those on the margins, who we welcomed, who we healed, who we touched, and whose lives we are called to touch today through our prayers, but also through our practical and caring support. So let's pray. We've just read these words, turn your ear to me, come quickly to my rescue, be my rock of refuge and the strong fortress to save me. Lord, in recent years, the profile of the needs of this world have been raised considerably. We think upon the impact of human activity upon the world that you created. We reflect upon our inability to steward the good world that you have put there for us to care for. Lord, we repent of those ways in which we have sought to exploit this world and the people within it. And Lord, we pray for ways and opportunities to move forward in such a way that it becomes a blessing for all as we care for them and their circumstances. We remember before you today, dear, dear Lord, our brother, Pastor Martin, his congregation, facing difficulties on so many fronts. Not wealthy, living right on the edge of the lagoon, a marginalised people, and yet focused on serving you and proclaiming the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you, Lord, for the way and means that they have found to support one another, to share things, to find common ground and common good. And we find that, and Lord, are encouraged by that model as being part of a church that we might share, that we might work together, that we might collaborate with others here in this nation, not just to support ourselves or our town or our denomination or our city, but to support believers across the world. We thank you that being part of the church means that we are part of a church that is not just local or national, but universal across this world. And that those who worship, perhaps in hours from now, will be worshipping you, the same God, in spirit and in truth. And so we pray for them. We pray, Lord, for our nation and our town. That in this week where we, where we remember the need to pray for unity between Christian believers, we pray for the work of the churches in this town for those communities that we support, for those causes that we work alongside with, for Swindon Youth for Christ, for the homelessness projects, for good news for Swindon. We remember the churches and fellowships seeking to reach out to you in love across our town. So very different in so many ways, yet Lord focused upon the one need to proclaim you as Saviour and Lord. So we pray for our Christian neighbours. Pray for St Barnabas Church here in Gorse Hill, for the Salvation Army, for Bible Life Fellowship. Remembering especially uh, Reverend Cathy at St Barnabas who has so recently lost her dad. We pray that we may continue to find ways of working together in the cause of the gospel as together we present the good news of Jesus to a community, to a world that is visible in a way that people will say of us as they said of the early church see how much they love one another and Lord we remember before you the needs of those across this world who remain marginalised broken excluded we remember the poor we remember Lord 
they, those t caught up in, in war and, uh, and in turmoil. Remembering especially this morning the circumstances surrounding Ukraine. It, it's like we're on a knife edge, Lord. Those of us who've lived through the Cold War in the 60s and 70s, there's a feeling that we're almost back to a knife edge of confrontation. And we pray, Lord, that we would move back from the danger, the pain, the agony that that causes. And somewhere in the middle of this, there is a country, a people, whose lives are being debated by others. And we pray that God will uplift them where they are now. And in this, Lord, this international week to support those suffering from leprosy, we remember that disease that is spoken of in the scriptures, the rules, the regulations, the laws that surrounded it, and yet Christ came not just to transcend, but to fulfill that law by showing grace and love and mercy to those in need. He touched the leper. He healed the sick. He brought sight to the blind and proclaimed the year of the Lord's favour. And we pray that we may know how to support those in need in our community and in our world today. We thank you as ever for those agencies that support those people most in need. Lord, when you see this for yourself, as when we see it for ourselves, we're confronted by a need that staggers us. And yet we know that you are a God who can do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine. So we offer our prayers to you this day for our community, for our world, for ourselves and for others, but praying over all that your kingdom will come and that your will will be done. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. I'm going to hand over to the worship group who are going to leave us in singing again. So thank you back over to you. Thank you, Steve. Um, yeah, Steve said we're going to continue in our worship now through some songs. Um, and again, I'd just like to um, encourage each of us to, to use this time as we need to. We've all had different weeks, we've all had different mornings, um, yet we come before the same God. Um, and these songs are, uh, are here for us to be able to give God our praise and our worship. Um, so I encourage each of us to be able to do that in whichever way. Uh, we need to this morning, whether that's being quiet and still or whether that's jumping up and down. Um, so uh, however you need to respond, uh, just be encouraged and free to be able to do that and let God move in this place.
stone, weak made strong in the Savior's love. Through the storm, He is Lord, Lord of all. Let's just have a moment of quiet. Speak. Father God, we recognize that without you, we are weak. And as our song says, with you, we are weak, made strong through your love for us. And Father, whatever challenges that we may be facing at the moment, Lord, we can do so knowing that you love us and that you are with us and that you will never, ever leave us. And for that, Lord, we are thankful and we are so, so grateful. Amen. Do take a seat. Thank you to Matt and the worship group. Wasn't it beautiful to hear those voices? You know, a foretaste of heaven as we share in worship together. As we hear God speaking to us through the words of those songs. Let's now pray that we hear God speaking to us through the words of the scriptures. I'm going to read from 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 1 to 12. There will be particular emphasis, I think, this morning, and it's important to do this on the words being built, that there's something going on with us and with God's church. It's not a static, it is a dynamic that God's church is being built. And, and as we heard last week, the gates of hell shall not prevail against that which God is doing. Peter begins, though, therefore, he says, rid yourself of all malice, deceit, hypocrisy, envy and slander of every kind. Like newborn babies crave pure spiritual milk so that by it you may grow up in your salvation now that you have tasted that the Lord is good. As you come to him, the living stone, rejected by humans but chosen by God and precious to him, you also, like living stones, are being built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For in Scripture it says, See, I lay a stone in Zion, a chosen and precious cornerstone, and the one who trusts in him will never be put to shame. Now to you who believe, this stone is precious. But to those who do not believe, the stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. And a stone that causes people to stumble and a rock makes them, that makes them fall. They stumble because they disobey the message, which is also what they were destined for. But you, you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. May God bless both the reading of the word and our meditation and thoughts upon it. What do we make of these verses? Well, if we could have our slides up, please. Thank you very much. Oh, we're a bit back. Let's go backwards. So here is 1 Peter 1 to 6, chosen by God. A picture. Anyone know what that is? Have you been watching Flog It, anyone? Or one of those antiques programmes? It's actually a vase. And it's produced by Whitefriars Glass, or it was, and its kind of common nickname is the Drunken Bricklayer. You can kind of see why, can't you? 
it isn't exactly straight. And whoever made it, made it deliberately like that, so it's not an accident, but it's made deliberately like that as form and presumably artistic merit. But it's the drunken bricklayer. I've got a pail full of building tools in my shed that were left to me by an old friend who was a bricklayer. Now, if I pick those up and try and do something with them, I could do something, but I'd make an awful mess. Just having the tools doesn't make you the bricklayer. I suppose my efforts would come out something a bit like that. One brick would be on top of another, but it wouldn't be in line. And it would make the wall or the building unsound, unsafe. It, it wouldn't be right, it wouldn't look right, it wouldn't function correctly. You and I are being built into something by a master builder, not by a drunken bricklayer. There is purpose, there is reason, there is form, there is function in the way that the church is being built by God. Peter writes to the church in Rome. It was a church under persecution. It was a church that was struggling, and yet he writes to encourage the believers both then and now. That irrespective of our race or our background, despite our circumstances, that God is in the process of building his church. We can expect difficulty to come. We can expect that sometimes we might feel like outcasts or aliens or, or outsiders. But the predominating theme of Peter's writing is that of hope that there is something happening. We are a chosen people. We were once those on the outside, but now we have come inside because of the mercy of God as we see in the sacrifice of Christ for all believers. And our songs have reminded us of that. Christ alone, cornerstone, weak made strong in the Saviour's love. I mean, what an expression of what God is doing and has done and will do until the times come to their end. We have been chosen, and we've been chosen for a purpose. Why is it that, that the church is being built? Why is it that, that the church has such power today? Well, the answer is the church has power. The church has been chosen to express the will of God, to express the vision of Christ, to express the power of the Holy Spirit in the world in which we find ourselves. Who is God going to use? Answer, his church. How is he going to use his church? Answer, by using the gifts and the talents that we have together. There will be bricklayers, as it were, amongst us. There will be church planters and builders. There will be preachers. There will be evangelists, administrators. There will be those who sing. There will be those who pray, and so on, and so on, and so on. Because that's what the church is. And that's what the church has always been. God's creation. God's rock, God's refuge, but also God's design and God's intention. We have been called, as the word says in verse 9, out of darkness into his wonderful light. It's that theme that runs through Advent and through Christmas, isn't it? The people walking in darkness have seen a great light. Upon those living in the shadow, a light has dawned. We have received light. We have received life. We have received mercy. Now we are. We're chosen. We're a royal priesthood. Don't make us all priests. You might be pleased to know that you won't all be invited to preach. You can if you feel God's leading you. But we all each have talents and giftings. The idea is, is that Peter is using a parallel to the Old Testament and the Jewish teaching about priests being set aside for God's purpose. And that's what all of us are. That is the church's intention, that we are set aside, we depend on God. You know, as in those verses we read from, from Psalm 31, into your hands I commend my spirit, my times are in your hands. It's true for all of us. And God knows no distinctions in function within the church. We'll see in a couple of weeks' time when we come to 1 Corinthians 12 that, that God gives to some talents and gifts in different ways. If we are doing what God asks us to do 100% of the time to our full ability, then that's all God asks of us. He doesn't see hierarchy or distinction in function. He sees all of us as being gifted and equipped 
as a, a royal priesthood, as a chosen people, as people melded and joined together to be a most wonderful thing. Some of it is visible, some invisible. The church, I guess, then was perhaps a little bit more invisible than perhaps the church is now. They didn't have buildings. They weren't on street corners. There wasn't evangelistic outreaches. They did it themselves one by one. They, they met together, yes. But they proclaimed Jesus through their everyday work and their everyday life. They depended upon him. Going back to that psalm again, their times, their commitment was to Christ direct. But there is a living hope that Peter speaks of. A living church that is the invisible, made, made, made present, made visible. Hope sees the invisible, feels the intangible, the thing you can't really grasp, but achieves the impossible. God is able to do more than we ask or imagine. And what little we can give, what little we may offer, what, what minimal thing we think we're doing, if we do it in the name of Jesus Christ, then God uses that to impact people's lives. Two years ago, when COVID hit, we began in week one with six hot meals. God has used that to build not just the hot meals, not just the lunch club again, not just the bags of hope, not just the community fridge, but a whole host of ways in which we're reaching out to the community. It's living hope. God commits that he will build. It's built on a firm foundation, which is the firmest foundation of all. 1 Corinthians 3, 11. Let me just read you what that says. It is built on the firm foundation that is Jesus Christ. 1 Corinthians 3, 11 says these words. By the grace God has given me, says Paul, I had a foundation as an expert builder and someone else is building on it. For no one can lay any foundation other than the one already laid, which is Jesus Christ. I have to say to you, as I say to myself, what are we building on? How are we being built? How do we understand what building is as we look to the future as well as to the present? And it is the work as a master builder. You know, this isn't the drunken bricklayer. This isn't me picking up a trowel, mixing up some cement, sticking it in a bucket and trying to lay two bricks on top of another. Okay, it might be okay to fill a little hole up, but it ain't good when you're trying to build a structure that needs to stand because we are a work in progress. You know, we've touched on this already. We are called by God. There is a purpose, there is a meaning. There is something happening when we are set aside by God and it is bigger and wider than who we are and where we are and what we are together. It's much bigger than that. Although that in itself is important and is relevant for us all. It is important that we understand who we are in Christ. It's important that we understand what we're doing as a fellowship and as churches together. It's vital that we consider ways in which we collaborate with the wider universal church to proclaim Jesus Christ. And that is the purpose and the goal, to proclaim Jesus Christ. You know, as, as we began, it, it talked about, didn't it? Peter said, get yourself right. Don't get wound up in fruitless exercises of hypocrisy, deceit. Don't, don't bite and snap at each other, but crave the spiritual milk that enables you to grow and to build up. Having had three children, I, I do know a little bit about them, but you know, even I know one thing. You don't give a two-week-old baby a pork pie. Not even put through a blender. No, it might happen after six months or, or whatever. But you and I are spiritual babies. We, we grow up and we take on diet as God enables us to understand. But the idea is we may grow up in our salvation. Grow up and know more and love more and understand more. Now he says that you've tasted the Lord is good. You want more, don't you? You know that thing that you really like eating, that you've tasted, you know it's good and you want more? You want more of it and you want more of it. Now, one form of diet is perhaps not good for the human body, but one form of spiritual diet is the only way in which we're going to grow. Because if we take our refreshment from the wrong places, if we take our nourishment as we might perceive it from the wrong food, then we're not going to grow up at all. We're just going to grow outwards. 
and not grow upwards and wider. So we're being built. We are a work in progress. Uh, and it's all based around a cornerstone, which, which is that understanding that the cornerstone is the biggest stone, the foundation stone. It's much bigger. You, you look at an old church, and you often see, particularly a Saxon church, a big cornerstone. In some buildings, that cornerstone can be metres long and metres deep. It's, it's the one by which everything else is squared off, everything else is measured by, everything else stands upon. But we too are building. We too are called to build. And our building is the visible expression of what church is. It's the outworking of what has happened invisibly to us and as a fellowship. And God's church should always be on the march. Yes, we may tread water, we may, we may ease off a bit as, as we're kind of trying to grapple with circumstances, as, as we've had to over the past couple of years. But that is no excuse for longer term saying, we'll stick where we are. Because God says you are being built. You're in a new place. You are a new people. You are a holy set-aside nation, a, a, a group of people with a particular goal and a particular end in mind. But you have a specific foundation, which is common to all, Jesus Christ. The church is built on Jesus Christ. It is built on a unique relationship. We belong to God, we belong to mother. It is built on a clear aim that we are always celebrating who God is and what God has done in Christ. We are always thanking God. We're always willing to be in the presence of God. And if the church isn't willing to be like that and have a vertical relationship, then we question really whether it's a church. If it isn't proclaiming Christ, is it truly a church? Because the church is built on, based on, driven by, founded through, and directed within Christ himself. You know, we are his bride. And if we're not prepared to be that, prepared to be in relationship, then that really does become a major challenge and a major question mark. If we're not in that relationship with God through Christ, truly, what are we? Is it simply the Rotary Club at prayer? Is it simply that? The church is more than that. It is more than a social group. It is more than uh, an hour or so out on Sunday morning. It, it is more than going through motions. It is relationship. And what Peter speaks about here is relational. A priesthood, holiness is always relational. It is about character and engagement because to have character, you've got to follow an example. And you follow the example of Jesus Christ. Be ye holy as I am holy. Go back to the Old Testament. God's call to relationship. Nothing has changed today. God's call upon you and I is still exactly the same. So where does it leave us in terms of growing up and growing upwards? Well, I want to leave you with a couple of thoughts. The first one is, the church means going deeper with God. Always being ready to listen, to learn, and to express. But to put Christ first means of being certain of what we believe. Our faith, our practice, all come together. Yeah, there are different expressions of practice, different ways of doing church, but at the same time there is one Lord who is above all and in all. The church is based on Christ and his sacrifice. The church always should be looking to, to say, how can I be like Jesus in my relationships with the world and in my relationship with God and in my growth as a believer? But also the church is always ready to become less invisible. To have discipleship with attitude. To stand up, to make a difference. To be a priest who is seen. To live a life that is not bound by legalism, but is limited by grace. And when you're limited by grace, you have an awful lot of freedom. Because then you've got generosity. Because then you've got the character of Jesus. You know, think about what Jesus did. Grace and generosity. Well, it's going to, to share with the people who no one else will share with. It's doing the stuff that people say, well, you shouldn't be doing that as a church. It's going out to the margins, but it's going within to the heart. Because you can't go out to the margins until you've gone into the heart. 
And that's a major aspect of, of what church is. We're called to be ready to be not just the invisible church of people who grow together, but to be the visible church who are the royal priesthood, who are the holy people, who are the nation, God's special possession, that we may declare the praises. And we declare our praises in so many ways, not least in our call to be one, not least in our call to be one with God, not least in our call to be one in the Spirit and to proclaim Christ as Saviour and Lord. That is the church. Let's now be it. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. We've got a final song and then a prayer. And I'm going to invite you to share the grace together. And the words of the grace will come up on the screen there. But our final song is a wonderful old hymn, Blessed Assurance, Jesus is Mine. It's a song that reminds us of relationship, but also ownership. Who is it that we are? So over to the worship group.
I, I think it would be a really good idea to do this a cappella. <laughs> so, um, yeah. So is it Steve and Sharon, is it? Anyone else? <laughs> cool, okay. <laughs> Happy birthday <laughs> to you. Happy birthday to you. 